Hello everyone, welcome once again to Reading Culture. Today we're going to be looking at a perhaps rather obscure story by a possibly rather obscure author, but one who I think is really quite important to uh, the fantasy literary genre of the 20th century. So one of the things that we've been looking at in recent videos have been oral stories, right? Oral myths. Myths passed down generation to generation, right? Elders telling them to the young and stories of perhaps almost unimaginable antiquity in some cases uh, being preserved, right? memories that are not lost. And within this broader conversation that we're having about heroism, I think it's important to note that a lot of traditional stories about heroes are indeed very uh, ancient and, and coming out of a, uh, a tradition of oral storytelling from generation to generation particularly within the uh, context of song. Often tales and poems that would be, would be sung, particularly to harps, which is one of uh, the older instruments which we find in many cultures. So the author that we're going to be looking at today, you may very well not have heard of. Um, he's generally known, known as Lord uh, Dunsany. Now, he was an Anglo-Irish writer, right? living from 1878 to 1957. Uh, he wrote really quite extensively, uh, poetry and short stories and plays. His most famous work is probably his 1924 novel, The King of Elfland's Daughter, um, as well as his work, The Gods of Ghana. However, the text that we're going to be looking at today is known as the Cave of Kai. Now, it's actually a part of a larger called Time and the Gods. Again, this is a very, uh, like many of his other works, a very influential uh, work. Uh, later writers such as J.R.R. Tolkien, H.P. Lovecraft, and Ursula K. Le Guin um, have all been influenced by his writing. And the Time of the Gods is, the, the Time and the Gods is really a, uh, a fantasy novel of, of one of the first examples we have of this genre that is only starting to develop. Um, right, it was uh, published in the very early 20th century. Within this overall text, right, which is, uh, you know, involves an invented pantheon of deities uh, and what have you, there's a particular tale, a particular tale about a king. One of the things that we're going to see in the story as we read through it together is that we're, we exist, of course, in a, uh, right, in a land of fantasy, all right, with a king ruling over a fictional kingdom who will eventually go on a quest uh, in order to find something. So in that case, it's following a very traditional structure. However, one of the interesting things that I would like you to notice in the story is that the bounds of what we would consider the uh, perceivable land or geography are often trespassed by higher concepts or forms, right? So in other words, we're going to get almost a kind of uh, tangibility to memory and to uh, past generally than we would perhaps expect. I also would note uh, to really, as we read through it, keep in mind these tangible reminders as they show up in the text. For instance, when dust appears, right, think about the uh, tradition in, uh, in poetry of, uh, and literature and culture more broadly, of dust, right? Uh, the, right famously, of course, ashes to ashes, dust to dust, right? From dust thou art made, into dust thou shalt return, right? From the Bible, there is this sense of dust being this kind of origin point, right? This thing from out of which man springs and to which he will eventually return, right? So that just is a little bit of a introduction to the text. Uh, now let's begin to read through it together. So this is the Cave of Kai. The pomp of crowning was ended. The rejoicings had died away. And Kanazar, the new king, sat in the seat of the kings of Averon to do his work of 
upon the destinies of men. His uncle, Canazar the Lone, had died. He had come from a far castle to the south, with a great procession to Ilan, the citadel of Avaron, and there they had crowned him king of Avaron and of the mountains, and lord, if there be aught beyond those mountains, of all such lands as are. But now the pomp of the crowning was gone away, and Canazar sat far off from his home, a very mighty king. So the, the tale starts with this coming out of the south, right, into this new land in the north where he's, he's left his place of origin. Then the king grew weary of the destinies of Averon, and weary of the making of commands. So Canazar sent heralds through all cities, saying, Hear the will of the king, hear the will of the king of Averon, and of the mountains and lord, if there be aught beyond those mountains, of all such lands as are. Let there come together to Elon all such as have an art in secret matters. So he's calling all men to himself of secret matters, right? I think of, again, magicians and things like that. We also already get a sense that he is not only lord over a vast kingdom of an immense power, but even be lands beyond the mountains of which they know nothing. So what is beyond the mountains? Whatever it is, he claims it. There gathered together to Elon the wise men of all the degrees of magic, even to the seventh, who had made spells before Canazar the Lone, and they came before the new king in his palace, placing their hands upon his feet. Then said the king to the magicians, I have a need. And they answered, The earth touches the feet of the king in token of submission. But the king answered, My need is not of the earth. But I would find certain of the hours that have been, and sundry days that were. So what the king is asking here is he's seeking for the past, his own past, the past that's long gone. He's asking the magicians how he can get it back. And all the wise folks were silent, till there spake out mournfully the wisest of them all made spells in the seventh degree, saying, The days that were and the hours have winged their way to Mount Agdora's summit, and their dipping have passed from sight, not ever to return, for happily they have not heard the king's command. So this wise man, he says that these, these days cannot be reclaimed. Even by the great king, for all his power, he cannot command the past to return. Of these wise folks are many chronicled. Moreover, it is set in writing of the scribes, how they had audience of King Canazar, and of the words they spake. But of their further deeds, there is no legend. But it is told how the king sent men to run and pass through all the cities, that they should find one that was wiser even than the magicians that had made spells before Canazar the Lone. Far up the mountains that limit Averon, they found Siren, the prophet, among the goats, who was of none of the degrees of magic, and who had cast no spells before the former king. Him they brought to Canazar, and the king said unto him, I have a need. And Siren answered, Thou art a man. And the king said, Where lie the days that were, and certain hours? These things lie in a cave, away, far from here, and over the cave stands sentinel one, Kai. This cave Kai hath guarded from the gods and men, since ever the beginning was made. It may be that he shall let Canazar pass by. So the king finds this other wise man, a wise man who is not a practitioner of magic, who is, it seems, a goatherd, he lives among the goats, but he has the answer the king seeks. He tells him that these days lie in a cave. Right? Note that this seemingly intangible thing of memory of the days of the past, right? It's, it can be found in this place, this sacred place. But it is guarded by Kai, a being who at this point we know not what. But it's noted here that he guards it even from the gods as well as men. There's a sense that even the gods cannot claim these past days. 
Then the king gathered elephants and camels that carried burdens of gold, and trusty servants that carried precious gems, and gathered an army to go before him, and an army to follow behind, and sent out horsemen to warn the dwellers of the plains that the king of Averon was afoot. So we have a great martial company assembled, right? This great army, this host going out to find this cave of lost memory. And he bade Siren to lead that to that place where the days of old lie hid and all forgotten hours. So again, he's seeking out, he's going to find this place where these forgotten times lie hid. Across the plain and up Mount Agdara and dipping beyond its summit went Canazar the king and his two armies who followed Siren. Eight times the purple tent with golden border had been pitched for the king of Averon. And eight times it had been struck, ere the king and the king's armies came to a dark to a dark cave in a valley dark, where Kai stood guard over the days that were. And the face of Kai was as a warrior that vanquisheth cities and burdeneth himself not with captives, and his form was as the form of gods, but his eyes were the eyes of beasts, before whom came the king of Averon with elephants and camels bearing burdens of gold and trusty servants carrying precious gems. So he finds the place where these days of the past lie hid, but it, it's guarded by Kai. He's a, he has a warrior, as, uh, uh, he, he's a warrior, but he has a godly, a divine aspect. It's also bestial. Again, there's something dark and perilous about this place and this person who guards the entrance so fiercely. Cerebus guarding the gates of Tartarus. Then said the king, Yonder behold my gifts. Give back to me my yesterday with its waving banners, my yesterday with its music and blue sky, and all its cheering crowds that made me king, the yesterday that sailed with gleaming wings over my Averon. Again, the king seeks this yesterday. This is what he wants more than anything, that which he has lost. And Kai answered, pointing to the cave. Thither, dishonored and forgot, thy yesterday slunk away, and who amid the dusty heap of the forgotten days shall grovel to find thy yesterday? Again, there's this question, can it be reclaimed? He speaks of it as though it has been dishonored, right? it's slunk away, as though it is lying in defeat. Can it, can it be brought back? Can it be revivified? Then answered the king of Averon, and of the mountains and lord, if there be aught beyond them, of all such lands as are. I will go down on my knees in yon dark cave, and search with my hands amid the dust, if so I may find my yesterday again, and certain hours that are gone. The king, right, even though he's a king, he is willing to go down on his knees and search the dust for these memories, so desperate is he to reclaim them. Again, note this imagery of dust, right? this idea that these scattered particles, this is the memory of the past. And the king pointed to his piles of gold that stood where elephants were met together and beyond them to the scornful camels. And Kai answered, the gods have offered me the gleaming worlds and all as far as the rim and whatever lies beyond it as far as the gods may see. And thou comest to me with elephants and camels. So, in other words, Kai is, is, has nothing but contempt for these material gifts. The king offers him this mass of gold on his uh, camels, and Kai says, All the world, to the very rim of the world, as far as the gods can see, is mine. Why would I care for these paltry gifts? He's, the king is hoping to essentially bribe him to let him in, and he utterly fails. He has nothing to offer Kai that he wants. Then said the king, Across the orchards of my home there hath passed one hour, whereof thou knowest well. And I pray to thee, who will take no gifts borne upon elephants or camels, give me of thy mercy one second back, one grain of dust that clings to that hour in the heap that lies within the cave. So the king, there's, there's a particular hour that he knows, and we, we know not what it is, but the king 
desperately desires that hour back. But he even goes so far to say, I would even take one second. One second from that time is all I ask. And note this image of, of a heap of dust within the cave and that this heap of dust is the past, right? And just as things turn to dust through the slow decay of time, that is the decay of the past and of one's memory of the past. And that in this heap of dust, he would like to cling to just one grain of dust, which is equivalent to one second of the memory of the past. That's all he asks for. And at the word mercy, Kai laughed. The king turned his armies to the east. Therefore, the armies returned to Avaron. And, and the heralds before them cried, Here cometh Canazar, king of Avaron, and of the mountains and ward, if there be aught beyond those mountains of all such lands as are. So the king, are, the, the armies of the king are ordered to return. Right? They're leaving in defeat. Right, this last plea for mercy, right, with the king saying, of thy mercy, give me one second, is met with disdain and contempt. Kai laughs at the word mercy. There is no mercy in his heart. And his armies, the armies of the king, can do nothing but return home. And the king said to them, say, rather, that here comes one greatly weary, who, having accomplished naught, returneth from a quest forlorn. So his quest has failed. If the main quest of the story, if the main quest of the hero of this quest, if we can conceive of the king as such, has not been successful, he has not achieved these days of old, they are guarded, it seems, impenetrably by Kai. So the king came again to Avaron. Again, he returns in defeat. So it seems. But, it is told how there came into Elan one evening, as the sun was setting, a harper, the golden harp, desiring audience of the king. So we see this harper come, and again, imagine this as uh, taking place in a world, perhaps not too unlike certain cultures of our own past, where these harpers, these tra traveling minstrels or bards, to travel with their harp and sing songs, but not the kind of lyrical songs that we might think of, of as today, but narrative songs, stories, stories of past tales, past heroes, past adventures. Think of the oral stories we have already looked at. Imagine these stories being sung, music, harp. And it is told how men led him to Canazar, who sat frowning alone upon his throne. To whom said the harper, I have a golden harp, and to its strings have clung like dust some seconds out of the forgotten hours and little happenings of the days that were. So note what he's saying here. He's saying that the dust of forgotten memory clings to the harp. Right? So we have, again, the return of this image that just as all things materially decay right into dust and what have you, that so does the memory, but that this memory, this dust can cling to things. Now all of it is piled up in this cave of Kai that cannot be accessed. It clings to the harp. And again, imagine what this image is suggesting to us. Think about what it means. This idea that the dust represents the past, even if it's only mere seconds of it, these small particles. So the dust clinging to the harp the strings of the harp is the past clinging to the harp, which means it's the past clinging to the song, which means it's the song. It's these tales, these stories, these narratives that are preserving these particles of the past. There's a sense that what is keeping past stories from dying, from passing into that impenetrable cave of Kai, is story. Specifically, in this case, sung story, the sung story of the harper. That is what is clinging to the strings of the harp as he plays it. And Canazar looked up, and the harper touched the strings, and the old forgotten things were stirring again. And there arose a sound of songs that had passed away, and long since voices. 
Then, when the harper saw that Kenazar looked not angrily upon him, his fingers tramped over the cores as the gods tramped down the sky, and out of the golden harp arose a haze of memory. And the king, leaning forward and staring before him, saw in the haze no more his palace walls, but saw a valley with a stream that wandered through it, and woods upon either hill, and an old castle standing lonely to the south. And the harper, seeing a strange look upon the face of Canazar, said, Is the king pleased, who lords it over Averon and the mountains, if there be aught beyond them over all such lands as are? The king's... The, 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 King's memories are being reclaimed through the harper's song. Right? These memories long since lost are being brought back to him. And the king said, Seeing that I am a child again in the valley to the south, how may I say what may be the will of the great king? The king says that he is no longer king in this moment. He is a child again. His past is so vividly and truly before him that he no longer even sees the palace around him. He's so utterly uh, encompassed by this valley to the south from which he originally came before claiming the kingdom. When the stars shone high over Elon, and still the king sat staring straight before him, all the courtiers drew away from the great palace, save one that stayed and kept one taper burning, and with them went the harper. Right, so we get this sense that all night long, this one servant holding a taper at a candle before the king and the harper stay there as the king continues to be lost in these memories of past times. And when the dawn came up through silent archways into the marble palace, making the taper pale, the king still stared before him, and still he sat there when the star shone again clearly and high above Elon. So still, when the dawn comes, all night long the king has been staring. But on the second morning, the king arose and sent for the harper and said to him, I am king again, and thou that hast the skill to say the hours and mayest bring again to men their forgotten days. Thou shalt stand sentinel over my great tomorrow. And when I go forth to conquer Zeman Ho and make my armies mighty, thou shalt stand between that morrow and the cave of Kai. And haply some deed of mine and the battling of my armies shall cling to thy golden harp and not go down dishonor in the cave. For my tomorrow, who with such resounding stride goes trampling through my dreams, is far too kingly to herd with forgotten days in the dust of things that were. But on some future day, when kings are dead and all their deeds forgotten, some harper of that time shall come, and from those golden strings awake those deeds that echo in my dreams, till my tomorrow shall stride forth among the lesser days, and tell the years that Canazar was a king. So what is being asked here? To kind of unpack this passage. The king is asking that the harper should stand between the cave of Kai, the place where memories are locked and unreachable, and the morrow, the day, specifically the day as he goes out to conquer this land and engage in these great deeds. And the idea is that the dust of the memories, right, so again, these memories are Right, the images is them as dust piled up in the cave of Kai that cannot reach. They will not, in fact, be lost forever in the cave of Kai, because before they can reach the cave guarded by Kai, at least particles of dust, particles of memory, seconds of memory, cling to the harp, cling to the strings of the harp. Thus, they will not be forgotten in the cave of Kai, but being preserved on these strings, even when all kings are dead and all living people have forgotten them. Because they cling to the string, they will not be trampled down. And answered the harper, I will stand sentinel over thy great tomorrow. And when thou goest forth, 
to conquer Zimon Ho and make thine armies mighty, I will stand between thy morrow and the cave of Kai. That thy deeds and the battling of thine armies shall cling to my golden harp and not go down dishonored into the cave. So that when kings are dead and all their deeds forgotten, harpers of the future time shall awake from these golden cords, those deeds of thine. This will I do. So the harper agrees. He will stand between the cave of Kai and the morrow. He will tell these deeds. Remember what it means to say that, that these dust, these particles of memory will cling to the strings. It means that the harper will sing of his deeds. He will sing the tales like the oral stories we have already been given. He will sing of them. And not only will he sing of them, but it will be passed down in tradition. So the word tradition comes from the Latin and it means to hand over. In other words, tradition is that which is handed down. So the idea is that the tradition of these stories would be handed from generation to generation, harper to harper, just like the oral tales we've seen already. And thus they won't be forgotten. But notice, that especially the idea of, of life, the imagery of life that's used here, right? The idea that these deeds, they'll, they'll be awakened, right? They'll be revivified. These memories will be kept alive. They won't just be dead memories, like a dead pile of dust in the cave of Kai, right? There will be living things attaching themselves to living strings. Men of these days that be skilled upon the harp still tell of Canazar, how that he was king of Averon and of the mountains and claimed lordship of certain lands beyond and how he went with armies against Zimon Ho and fought great battles. And then the last, gained victory and was slain. The Kai, as he waited with its claws to gather in the last days of Kanazar, that he might loom enormous in his cave, still found them not, and only gathered in some meaner deeds and the days and hours of lesser men, and was vexed by the shadow of a harper that stood between him and the world. So this final paragraph, this conclusion of the story, the cave of Kai, right? We see the plans fulfilled, that all the deeds of Kanazar are sung by the harper, all his great battles and conquering of these foreign lands and all this victory is preserved by the harper. And we get this image of cave he's described now as having claws again this bestial form right? that he's seeking to gather in the last days of Kanazar and add them to his heap of dust that will be forgotten forever right it says that right he, that he they might loom enormous in his cave the idea that all the great deeds of Kanazar will be so great that the pile will reach to the very limits of the cave but he can't find them he can only gather in some meaner deeds in other words, deeds that are of less value, that aren't important, aren't noble, aren't, we could perhaps say, heroic. And the days and the hours of lesser men, again, perhaps less heroic men. And he's vexed, right? He's troubled. He's annoyed that he can't find these things. And that which is pre preventing him is the shadow of the harper. The harper may, by this point, long since have died, but because he has passed on from generation to generation these stories of old, his shadow extends out into the future and is preventing him. It's standing between Kai and the world. So note in this story, these themes of tales and note also the style of how it is written. It is written as though it is being told to you, as though it is an oral story that's been passed on. No, it's not. It's, it's, it was written in the 20th century. Um, the, this, this tale is not, in fact, a true oral tale. But it is written in that style. And in so doing, it is trying to make the reader enter back into this ancient time, as the title of the full work is, The Time and the Gods. So in considering this tale, especially as a tale of heroism, it might be worth considering how it is that great deeds, deeds of heroism and the tales of various heroes, how they are preserved generationally by storytelling, and how these stories, these stories which societies and cultures find meaningful, how they are preserved like particles of dust on strings, 
as we sing tales. And even if we don't sing tales with the harp anymore, we still tell them. And the telling of these tales preserves them and keeps them alive. So long as men remain.